Hello and welcome to paramedicine.com, translating research into practice. My name is Mark Kolbeck and I'm in sunny Brisbane, Australia. And this is going to be a uh, episode on the neurological assessment, an absolutely uh, fundamental bit of kit in the paramedic tool bag. Anybody with altered mental status or loss of consciousness or dizzy or confusion or anything like that, we're going to be doing a neurological assessment on. So the uh, PowerPoints for this presentation are on SlideShare. There's the link below. Just go to SlideShare, search for paramedicine.com and you should see this. Uh, you're free to use the PowerPoints for this demonstration as you wish, as long as it's for non-commercial purposes. So overall, the whole lecture, this is what we're going to be talking about. A uh, bit of an introduction and overview to what the neurological assessment is and why we do it. Then we'll talk about the mental status assessment, alertness, orientation, memory, and Glasgow Coma Scale. Not that I'm crazy about the Glasgow Coma Scale, but it's what we all use. Talk a little bit about how we assess uh, a patient's eyes, how we assess their neck and their movement in general. We'll talk about cranial nerves, a little bit about, in particular, a stroke exam. So if you think your patient's having a stroke, what we should assess for. Then we're going to uh, talk through how to assess for dermatome, how to assess the dermatomes, how to assess the myotomes, and very briefly talking a little bit about the reflexes. And then at the end, um, I'm going to do a bit of a deeper dive and talk about what all of that just meant. So although this is primarily a very practical, hands-on, applied sort of skills type um, overview of what we're doing, I think it's really under, important that you understand why we're doing it and what the findings actually mean. That's the difference, again, as always, between a technician and an actual clinician. And I encourage clinicians, so that's what we're going to be talking about here. So let's paint a scenario. You walk into the emergency department with the patient on your stretcher and uh, there's the very sort of critical and imposing and foreboding physician saying, so how's your patient? And they want a quick, concise report. Remember, you got about 30 seconds. They know that you're coming in with altered mental status patient of some sort. So what are you going to say? What's the report that you're going to give to somebody to be complete and accurate, but also concise? Here's what you can say. Patients alert and oriented to person, place, and time with memory of distant, recent, and incident. There's no amnesic gaps. There's no major CNS issues, no syncope, no presyncope, vertigo, headaches, seizures, or trauma. Pupils are pearl, midline conjugate gaze. They're tracking well. They're accommodating normally. The cranial nerve, dermatome, myotome exams are all, uh, and the simple reflexes are all normal. If you say that, people will listen to you because each time you say those things, you're actually saying important things. And instead of them going, get to it, get to it, they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's nice and it's tight and concise. And if you're able to do that, then you'll have people listening to you. This quick report is also the template for how we're going to structure the rest of this presentation. So we're going to go through what all of those things mean in that same order, tell you how to assess them, uh, and then you'll be ready to report them and understand when something goes wrong, what that actually means. So let's do a bit of a case study just to set the stage for us here. And we're going to talk about Natasha Richardson. And the reason I'm using this case study is it's tragic, it's illustrative, it's also in the public domain. So I'm not breaching any patient confidentiality because I wasn't involved in this case at all. So if you don't know, Natasha Richardson is a very famous Hollywood actress. She was married to Liam Neeson, mother Vanessa Redgrave, also very famous. That's why this was all over the news. Uh, back a while ago now, 2009, she was uh, up in Canada skiing, I believe it was in Quebec, and she was skiing on a little bunny trail, a beginner's trail, um, and she fell over. She hit her head a little bit, but there was no obvious head injury, there was no neurological signs at the time, no loss of consciousness. Basically, somebody falling over with a low velocity impact, not somebody that we had a lot of concern or trepidation about clinically. Just to be careful, they took her to the infirmary. She seemed fine. She was joking about the incident, obviously clear, you know, cognitively lucid. She signed the forms against medical advice, uh, declining further treatment, left the infirmary. You know, we get people to sign whenever they leave. But from the sounds of what I've heard of this case, and again, I'm not directly involved, it sounds like probably people weren't terribly concerned about letting her go because she seemed okay. And, you know, you can't put everybody in observation for 24 hours. She fell down. She was fine. She said, I'm fine. I'm just going to go. Of course, because this is a case study, it ended tragically. About two and a half hours later, um, 
while she was in her apartment, I believe, they recalled an ambulance, taken to the hospital, and ultimately, unfortunately, medevaced down to the States and died during, due to an epidural hematoma. Tragic case. But it's, it's a bread and butter case for us. Somebody has a very minor mechanism of injury. They seem perfectly fine at the time. They say, I, look, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm, I'm happy to just go home. And we as paramedics in our gut go, yeah, okay, that's probably all right. Now, there's no tool that will 100% triage out everybody who's sick and everybody who isn't. There's no perfectly sensitive and specific tool for a neurological exam. But what would happen in a case like this is people would look over the records and say, well, did they do a thorough neuro exam? Did they carefully assess the patient before the patient was released? And if they were carefully and properly assessed, then, uh, then we say, look, you know, we did everything we could do. We told the person to recall and they did recall. And sometimes tragically, people have occult injuries and they can be very damaged or they can die from them. And that sounds like what happened in this case, quite tragically. So we're left with the question as paramedics, somebody who's had a minor mechanism of injury and we're left thinking, how's your brain? Is your brain okay? Because if your brain is okay, to speak in very sort of general layman terms, then I'm happy letting you go. But if I'm concerned at all that there's something wrong with your brain uh, or your peripheral nervous system, but more importantly, your brain, then I'd rather take you to the hospital. So here's how we assess if somebody's brain's okay. That's what we're going to be talking about. There's a bit of a review of the nervous system. We talk about the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. That goes down to the peripheral nervous system, which is all the nerves that run off of the spinal cord. We talk about the efferent and the afferent nervous system. The efferent is the motor nervous system. If I want to move, then I'm using my motor system. If I can feel something, then I'm using my sensory nervous system. Quick little mnemonic for that is the word same. So sensory is the afferent and motor is the efferent. It spells out the word same. If you're stuck on an exam, that's a nice little memory trick to use. The motor nervous system breaks down into uh, two subsystems. So there's the somatic, the body nervous system. So that's me moving my arms around. That's me talking. That's me walking. It's me, you know, getting a glass of water. Um, and then there's the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system, which sounds very much like the automatic nervous system, is basically what it is. It's digestion, heart rate, uh, respiration when we're not thinking about it. Um, uh, some of the twitches or you know postural readjustments, things like that. We don't necessarily think about those consciously. Um, so I shouldn't say, you know, reassessing our posture, because although we don't think about it terribly much, that's not the autonomic nervous system. It's more like the basic heart rate, respiratory rate. How fast am I digesting? Like, I don't think about, hmm, I should digest just a little bit more, you know, open up my cardiac sphincter now. Like, that's just not what I'm what I think about. And that autonomic nervous system, as you probably know, has two speeds, uh, panic and relax, or the uh, fight or flight and the rest and digest, or the sympathetic or parasympathetic branches. The sympathetic is that panic, um, fight or flight, and the parasympathetic is the relaxed, uh, you know, rest and digest nervous system. If you're a bit fuzzy on the autonomic, not autonomic nervous system, I've got another lecture up on YouTube, about a half an hour, that just reviews the autonomic nervous system in detail. As paramedics, we play a lot with people's autonomic nervous systems. A lot of the drugs that we use, adrenaline, atropine, you know, drugs like that, um, work on the autonomic nervous system. So you should have a pretty good understanding of it. It's not central to this sort of lecture, but if I said autonomic nervous system and you said, what's that? Um, make sure you fix that because you need to know what the autonomic nervous system is. Okay. So let's say I'm going to a call for a patient who's had altered mental status, confusion, loss of consciousness, something like that. And I just want to ask some basic general questions before I you know, dive down into the specifics of my physical assessment. What you'll normally find as paramedics is that we work in teams, not always, but usually we work in teams, either of equal training or one paramedic with higher training than the other. And usually it's the paramedic with the higher training or 
whoever's turn it happens to be, if you've got equal training, who does the interviewing of the patient, speaks to them, gives them instructions, asks them questions, interprets the results of the, the answers of the questions. And then the other paramedic acts as like the technician or the second. We talk about the primary or the attending paramedic and the secondary paramedic. So the secondary paramedic will generally do the physical examination, take the vital signs, listen to the chest, um, test the dermatomes, myotomes, things like that. So let's talk about some of the questions we can ask. Well, we can talk about uh, their mental status. We can say, hi, how are you today? Find out if they're alert, verbal, painful, and responsive. We'll talk about that. Get a Glasgow Coma Scale score. We can ask about orientation to person, place, and time. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you are? Do you know roughly what time it is? We can ask about the memory of distant, recent, and incident. I'll get into these a bit more as we go through, but this is just sort of the overview slide. We'll find out if they have any amnesic gaps in their memory. Is there any part of um, you know, the incident or today that they can't remember? Can they not remember things that happened before or not remember things that happened after the particular incident? Have they been dizzy? Have they had problems with balance or falling? We're going to try to rule in and rule out vertigo. Vertigo is the subjective sense that either the room is spinning around you or sometimes there's also a vertical vertigo, the sense that people are getting taller and shorter. That's much less common. Usually when we talk about vertigo, we talk about that subjective sense of spinning. If you've ever had just a little bit too much to drink and you've lay in the bed and you get the bed spins or the room spins, that's the sense of vertigo. Usually when people collapse, we ask them, was it a mechanical collapse? Did you feel weak and then you collapsed? Was it a vertiginous collapse? Were you dizzy and like, ah, and then lost your balance? Or, or was it like, um, did you trip over something? Was it just simply, uh, you know, you stumbled and that's why you fell? Have they had any sensory problems lately? So you can just think about the senses that you have in your head. Any problems with seeing or smelling or tasting or hearing or touching? We can ask those sorts of questions. We can ask about paresthesias. I wouldn't use those words, the word paresthesia. What I'd say instead is, have you, any no have you noticed any like pins and needles or tingling anywhere in your body? And the medical term for that is paresthesia. Any weaknesses, unexpected weaknesses um, in the limbs, obviously. We also ask particularly about the eyelids. Sometimes people have problems keeping their eyelids open, and that can indicate um, neurological problems as well. Then we can ask them, have you ever had any scans of your nervous system? Has anyone ever taken a detailed look of your nervous system? And if they say no, we move on. If they say yes, then we've got two questions. Number one is why? What were they looking for? What prompted you to get a CT scan or whatever it was that happened? And second, what did they find? Did they tell you about any results that were abnormal? And if so, what were they? And, you know, what were the implications of that? Sometimes people won't know these things, but it's good to ask generally anyways. Is there a history of neurological or mus muscular problems in your family, does anybody have any problems? There are some um, familial, hereditary, congenital diseases. Um, and if other people have them in their family, they might have them too. So we'll find out. You can ask about some of these things. And generally, I tend to think about this as going from the head down. So do you get headaches? Do you get migraines? Have you ever had uh, an infection in your brain, like meningitis or encephalitis? Do you ever have any electrical problems, like epilepsies or seizure, epilepsy or seizures? Ever blackout? Uh, do you ever have any mechanical injuries? Like have you had a, been in a car accident or fallen, had any head injuries or spinal injuries? Have you had any previous operations? If so, for what? And what did they find? What was the result of the operation? Uh, any sexually transmitted infections, which can infiltrate into the central nervous system? So we're moving down. Any problems with your heart, uh, cardiovascular disease, your heart or your blood vessels? Uh, does your heart beat regularly? Or have, has a doctor told you that it beats irregularly, like atrial fibrillation? Do you have high blood pressure? What sort of alcohol and drug use history do you have? And then we can ask about what medications are you taking? Well, first we say, do you take any prescribed medications? And if they say yes, we just go back to that same thing. What do you take and what is it for? Do you take it regularly? Is it helping? Those are just sorts of general questions that we get. So if they're on antihypertensives, it means probably at some point, we would hope, if they were properly prescribed, that they've got high blood pressure. So what's their blood pressure normally? And uh, what was it before? And are you taking the medication regularly? Let's take their blood pressure. 
Um, if they've taken too much of the antihypertensives, maybe they've got low blood pressure and that can cause people to pass out. So what medication are you taking? What for? Have you been taking the recommended dose? Have you noticed any changes since you started taking it? Just sort of general um, working in towards the bullseye sort of questions. If they're taking antidysrhythmics, it suggests that they have some sort of cardiac problem. So maybe they've taken not enough and they're still having their dysrhythmias, or maybe they've taken too much and they've suppressed their cardiac irritability and they're not firing off enough. If you've got somebody on antidysrhythmics and they're extremely bradycardic, you're going to start thinking maybe there's a correlation there. If they're taking anti-seizure medications, it suggests a history of seizures. Again, maybe they're not taking enough, maybe they're taking too much. If they're taking uh, tranquilizers or anxiolytics or sedatives or whatever you want to call those sorts of drugs, like benzodiazepines or something like that, or narcotics even, then um, we can ask a little bit about why they're taking them. And those medications, as we'll talk about when we talk about the pyramidal, extrapyramidal tracts, they can cause a toxic movement. They can cause problems with people's movement. So if you see somebody who is taking um, some tranquilizers and has problems with movement, there are little red flags that we should start thinking about. Uh, and then the antipsychotics. So anything that uh, antagonizes the dopamine 2 receptors can give us some bizarre postural, you know, all pistotonous type of things, um, extra pyramidal syndromes, and we'll, we'll get into that later. So if someone's taking medications, what were the medications prescribed for? What sort of effect did they have? And then ask yourself, could it be that they're not taking enough or that they're taking too much? Because in either case, we might start to run into problems. Okay, that's the quick introduction. That's your sort of working towards the bullseye, asking your broad questions. In the next bit, we're going to get into asking some more specific questions and doing some more specific examinations and uh, sort of teasing out the detail of some of the things that we've mentioned there.